Good evening and welcome to tonight's stream. Um, hope you had a nice long three day weekend. Happy MLK day. I don't know if that's something you say happy to. It's not something you I think it's more of a I don't know. I don't know how you qualify that. Um got a bunch of live shows set up for this week with more on the way. Sorry. If it is a nuisance to if you get reminders for this stuff, I don't know if there's a way to tweak those settings. I'm really glad you're subscribed, though, if you are it really helps the channel when people say stay subscribed. Um, when I first started doing this stuff almost two years ago, we're, we're approaching two years in March. So I've been doing this stuff for 22 months, I guess, 23 months now, 21 months now. It's surreal to me. It really is surreal when I think about it. Like, I never expected that this would be what I do, and this is what I do. And I love doing it, by the way. Um, I used to do a thing on the channel called Jeff Reads Wikipedia. It was a great setup for endless amounts of content, right? Super easy to do. I pick a, a, a weird, interesting Wikipedia page, and I read about it. And I read about the mellified man who is, you know, they used to make mummies out of they used to they used to make mummies out of people with honey you can turn someone into a you basically can candy a person what do i mean like candy as a verb like make them into a confectionery stuff like that um you know witch windows grain entrapment I used to read about all this different weird stuff and it was great and it was fun we did spring hill jack uh i was trying to do one every day and kind of got away from that. And, you know, I see these articles every once in a while. I'm like, man, I should really get back to that. But instead of doing Jeff Reed's Wikipedia, it's just part of the channel. Uh, so today we are talking about human, uh, talking about bread made out of human bones. Yes, you actually heard that correctly. And I want to go into this. We're going to approach this uh, subject matter. Um, it's macabre. And, you know, I, I want to have some respect for. Uh, the dead, even though they've been dead for hundreds of years now, you know, don't they say that like uh, doesn't, uh, you know, when enough time has passed, you can make light of a si bad situation. But I, if anything, it's a glowing reminder for us to recognize that, the you know, predicated on where you live in the world, because not everybody lives where we live in in this country i'm just saying that right now in general it, it, from a from a let, consider this to be a broad blanket statement and nothing more i'm not speaking from a play i'm not talking about individual subjective things i'm making a broad sweeping statement it has never been a better time to be a human being and alive that kind of thing we live at the dawn of this technological age you know how like crappy it used to be to live like to to live in like the Middle Ages or the Renaissance or, you know, around the the, the like just all those times like it was not good. It was not a good time. It was not, <laughs> it was not a good time to be a human being. Um, really not. Uh, and food. You know, we talk today about food scarcity and it does exist and it is absolutely a problem. There's also you know billions of people on the planet, but. You know, uh, you know, they talk about like this idea of food desert. What is a food desert? It's like if you don't have like uh, if you live in an area, it could be anywhere. It could be like an apartment building. You know, it could be like an urban area where you don't have ready access to fresh fruits and vegetables, something like that. You're, you're living in what's known as a food desert. You only have like processed items. But even there you have sustenance. What we're going to talk about today is a situation where it's like there is no food. There is no food, and the only way you're going to fill your belly is if you do something desperate, and that is what we're talking about. And that's what I mean that for the most part, on a broad, grand scale, because yes, there are starving children and people in third world countries, and we don't want to, like, again, I'm not trying to say it, like we all have it lucky. We most certainly do not. But in generally speaking, this is the best time for most people to be alive today, that kind of thing. That's what I mean to say. I don't even know if I, I feel bad about saying that too. Uh, maybe I'm just being too harsh on myself. In any case, we're 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 gonna we're hopping in a time machine. I'll, I'll shut up with the preamble about being we're, we're fortunate um, to be alive, and let's instead we're gonna hop in my frumus time machine. That's right. I want you to close your eyes for a minute. I want you to imagine that 
I'm like Willy Wonka in the glass elevator, but instead of having a glass elevator, it's a time machine. And I've got a very fancy hat. I don't have my, I don't have my, uh, my baseball cap on and I don't have my sunglasses. I am wearing like a purple velvet, um, overcoat with a cane. And I have wonder, wonderful scrum diddly umptious treats in my, in my time machine. I'm saying, get in my time machine. You say, I'm not getting into the time machine because you're a stranger and I don't get into time machines with strangers. And I say, well, I have candy. And you say, okay, you hop in, you know, as one would do. And we hop, we hop in my time machine and we travel back to the year 1590. And we're the, the, the place is Paris. And that's where we're going today. Um, and, and what's bringing us there is a website called Atlas Obscura. We've read from Atlas Obscura before. If you have not Listen to the how Gaba how Capicola became Gaba Goo, the story of the New Jersey accent. It is a fascinating history about accents. We're going to be talking about accents tomorrow as well. Um, about that sort of thing. That's the website we're 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 borrowing from. It's called, as I said, it's called Atlas Obscura. It's great. Highly recommend you check this out. This was written October 29th or published October 29th, 2018, by Emily Monaco. In 1590, starving Parisians ground human bones into bread. During a siege, desperation drove people to disinter skeletons. Now, what does disinter mean? Disinter means to, like, I guess, dig up. You're digging up a skeleton. Dig up her bones. <laughs> Wait, we're, we're not supposed to laugh. We're not supposed to make jokes about people suffering. Sorry. Uh, disinter means to dig up um, something that's been buried, especially a corpse. So during a siege, desperation drove people to disinter skeletons from cemeteries. That's what we're reading about. Happened, um, well, we're going to read about this, and there's some pictures. Here's a picture of a what's known as a charnel house at the Saints Innocent Cemetery in Paris, okay? Um, can we stop off in 1979 and see the misfits? No, there will be no, there will be no uh, seeing the misfits in 1979, unfortunately. We were going to the Parisian graveyard of 1590. Maybe, you know, we'll take Glenn Danzig. We'll pick him up in 1982 and we'll take him with us. And he'll probably uh, rob some graves and stuff instead of New Orleans. He'll do it in, in France. In the days leading up to the French Revolution, Paris was starving. Consecutive years of poor harvests led to bread riots and widespread hunger. In response, Queen Marie Antoinette purportedly said, well, if the people of Paris can't afford bread, let them eat cake. And she didn't actually say that. But let's stop there for one second. What do they mean when they say consecutive years of poor harvest led to bread riots? Because bread was a huge staple of the diet back in the day, right? Like you had to eat bread just to like be okay. You know, that was a huge, that was an anchor of your diet back in the medieval days. Like, remember how we were talking about how it would suck to live during medieval times? It's not just all knights roaming around. It's like you literally are tied to a piece of land that your ancestors have been farming for the last couple hundred years. You work from, you know, 5 a.m. from sunrise to dusk. You don't have a TV. You don't have books. You can't read. And your food consists of beer mixed with bread because you can't drink water. And in the and what what they when they say consecutive years of I'm just talking about that was the medieval times like I'm saying like it, it was not it was not easy it was not easy you know uh, you know couldn't just take this box of cheese it's here and you know crack it open and get you know there's 12 servings and there's 150 calories 12 servings in this one this is so calorie dense for somebody from the Middle Ages you know what I'm saying like that kind of thing. Um, but why would consecutive harvest years of poor harvests lead to to bread riots? It's because you your whole like sustenance your sustenance is predicated on farming. That's right. I mean, is that true today? Yes. But like we have means of food preservation. There's all. It's different, man. It's different. Back then, it was like you lived and died by what that 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 crop yielded, right? in many different ways. So this isn't just one poor harvest. This is a consecutive year. And, you know, you have larders or like grain store, you know, where you st store large heaps of grain. I don't know how long the grain lasts for, you know, but I, I assume like a surplus 
from a harvest could carry over into the next winter, you know, to make fresh bread. But essentially you're dealing when you're dealing with years, years, consecutive years, meaning one year after another in a row of poor harvest, you're, you're dealing with famine. Uh, in French, the former queen is credited with having said, oh man, I don't know how to say for, all right, let's try to say some French. Coulis magent de la brioche, brioche bread, let them eat brioche. But she didn't say that either. It was a popular phrase to attribute to the aristocrats, aristocrats, aristocracy, aristocracy in the 18th century. Uh, one that Swiss philosopher Jean Jacques Rousseau uh, bandied about quite a bit. But the snappy quote was never pronounced by the queen. It is, however, indicative of just how important bread was to the French. So that's why the writer is mentioning it, right? <laughs> <laughs> that's really cre creepy there. Uh, that's really creepy there. <laughs> um, yes, this is all document, all, all, all true DLW. Morg says, and that was before beer was carbonated. I think carbonated beer only became a common thing with mass production of glass bottles. I didn't know that. So probably flat beer most of the time for sure. So I didn't even know that about beer. Yeah, they're probably, well, I think there is some that I think, um, natural carbonation can happen as a result of the formation, uh, fermentation process. I'm not positive about that. I'm not, you know, a brewer or anything, but I think there's some, some carbonation. In any case, this is all indicative. This, this idea of let them eat cake or let them eat bread. It is indicative of just how important bread was to the French, right? Um, in the 15th and 16th centuries, the average person, check this out. The average person in France ate somewhere between 1.5 and 2.5 pounds of bread per day. That's pounds of bread per day. Okay. That's nuts. Think about that. Think about that. I don't know how much a, a, a loaf of bread is, but that is a lot of bread. I would imagine a loaf of bread is like a pound maybe, right? Could you imagine eating a whole, I have two slices of bread, three slices of bread in a day. I couldn't imagine eating a whole loaf, but I mean, that's how you got your calories. That's how you got your carbohydrates. You're, you're out in the field working and burning, burning energy. Like you need, you need to fuel your body somehow. They're probably burning all that stuff off, you know? Um, so that's crazy. 1.5 and 2.5 pounds of bread. Now I'm going to click on this real quick because it, it, there's a link here. I don't know what it's, what it, why it's, where it's taking me to. Okay, I guess that's the source. That is the source, and it's in French, and I can't read it, so we're not going to worry about that. But that's nutty, freaking almost three pounds of bread in some cases. That is, yeah, <laughs> that's right. If you're keto, you're in trouble, man. You can't. That's way too much bread. Uh, Danzig always has bone bread with his black pudding and devil. You know, he does, you know, that he does. Um, my friend, <laughs> my doctor would say no to a pound of bread per day. <laughs> That's right. Be a Patreon. That's right. Um, thank you. Thank you. Uh, uh, C, uh, CWB is a Patreon and he's saying become a Patreon. So check out the Patreon. Yes, I, I was, you know, I was thinking about making that joke, except it would be fee far fo. He says fee far fo from fee fi fo from, right? Walter White, I think that would be, that would make more sense. All right, let's keep reading though. Almost three pounds of bread. I will say my friend Jeremy, quick story, super quick story. Sorry, super quick story. My friend Jeremy and I were, were at this, um, this sort of industrial place up where I live over here. I can't explain it. It's like this factory building where people can rent rent space in it and one of them i guess was a i don't know they th this guy he was he was he did distribution for bread like a bakery distribution he had all these loaves of bread like in bags like you know sliced bread all all different varieties of bread you know cinnamon raisin uh sourdough like white bread whole wheat bread all the bread you can imagine he goes i can't i gotta dump all this bread it's kind of like it's literally bread that fell off the back of a truck. He goes, I'm, I'm just going to get rid of this bread. 
and uh, you know, you guys want to take any of it, it's just going to go to waste. I hate to see it go to waste. So why don't you take some of the bread? You know, in hindsight, he could have been a mafia guy. Who knows? But um, yeah, we took as much bread. We dinner rolls, baguettes. We took as much bread as as it could fit in my trunk. And my friend Jeremy, he ate a whole loaf of cinnamon raisin bread, sliced dry. He didn't have any liquid. He ate all but three slices of that loaf. And I just looked at him. I was aghast. I was aghast. I think it was whole wheat based or else he would have been in real trouble. I was aghast to, to compare that to eating 1.5 to 2.5 pounds of bread per day. Could you imagine the, uh, the, the bowel movements you try to make, like being that constipated unless you're drinking dirty water. Cause the back in the day, you couldn't even drink water. Like you had to drink beer. Like in the middle ages, you drank beer. You, that's how you hydrated yourself because all water had germs in it and it would get you very, very sick. That's what I mean when I say, for the most part, for the most of the people living today in this world, we live at the, we, you've never lived at a better time in, in, in the world, civilization wise. Um, Morg says carbon dioxide can only be dissolved in water with pressure. In ancient Egypt, they only had clay vessels and they said the beer was uncarbonated. Don't read this. Okay. <laughs> Cause I'm going to distract my, uh, the comments are flying in. All right. I'm going to keep going. <laughs> Uh, but for the uh, but for the poor, bread constituted the majority of their diet. The rich also enjoyed meat and another two liters of wine each day. So the rich got to eat 1.5 to 2.5 pounds of bread as well, but they also enjoyed meat and they had uh, another two liters of wine. But for the poor, bread constituted the majority of their diet. So when wheat was scarce, the French risked starvation, which is heartbreaking i mean it's so sad like there's nothing more tragic than that especially when like you'd have to imagine that like part of the problem was you know the class system and that if resources were located you know to to other people that you know um that maybe people wouldn't have starved the way that they did on some some of yes kids drank beer as well dude it's so nuts it's so nuts does this make Jack in the Beanstalk a French fairy tale? No, it makes Jack in the Beanstalk like a documentary about real things that happen. I grind your bones to bake my bread. It's true, man. It's freaking true. In any case, um, the French would risk star starvation. In Paris, this risk was more acute during a siege. What is a siege? Well, we all know the word siege. I, siege is where you're barricading yourself in, but let's get the actual de definition. It's a military. See, I would have never used military operation to describe it, but that there you go. That's why you need to look things up. It's a military operation in which enemy forces surround a town or building, cutting off essential supplies with the aim of compelling uh, the, them to surrender, uh, the surrender of those inside. So uh, the risk was more, the risk for starvation was more acute during a siege. Paris had endured numerous sieges throughout its long history. And we, you know, of course, if you watch the show Vikings, it's a great, great show. They show, you know, um, uh, what's his name? Uh, uh, oh my God, I can't remember his name. Um, uh, with an R, um, the Viking. Um, oh my God, this is killing me. Ragnar. Ragnar and his crew, they they try to they they do a siege on France and his brother Rollo um, is able to defend successfully defend the, the it's the Franks. It's not the French yet. They're the Franks. In any case, Paris has endured numerous sieges throughout its long history. The Vikings, as we just said, besieged the city in 1845. I'm guessing that's when Ragnar Lothbrook did it. In 1429, it was Charles VII and Joan of Arc. And in 1870, the Prussians. During these times of austerity, I don't know what austerity means. We got to look that up as well. Austerity means uh, sternness or severity of manner or attitude. Sternness. During these times of sternness, got it, okay. Uh, Parisians resorted to eating everything from military horses to street rats and zoo animals. Imagine spending your life in a zoo, not like a, even in a modern zoo where like things are better. They're like monitoring your diet. 
You know, could you imagine like a zoo back in the day? Like today, like, oh, they're taking your blood pressure and you don't have enough, you know, uh, fiber in your diet. So we're going to adjust your, you know, you're still in jail and it still stinks to be in a zoo, but at least like your needs are kind of being met like better. I would say better. You'd have to imagine like people with knowledge about your biology as an animal, like who understand you are at least trying to do their best keeping you comfortable while also being held captive. It's still sad because you're being held captive. However, you're like, your life is not as bad as like, say being in a zoo in 1429 or 1870 and being fed like bread. Probably you've like literally the shortest lifespan only to be eaten and consumed during times of austerity, my Lord. So they would resort to eating everything from military horses to street rats and zoo animals. And during one particularly problematic siege, they ate, they even ate bread made from human bones. Holy crazy. All right. So let's, let's talk about this for one second here. Let's, let's take a pause here to talk about bread. There's a guy on Instagram. He's a real nutbag. What he does is he makes bread. He makes pizza out of anything. And you say, Jeff, what do you mean? Out of any I mean, anything like he'll take bubble gum and make bread. He'll make pizza dough out of bubble gum, because at the end of the day, if you can grind it into a powder, you can turn it into bread. That's the ultimate truth. Bread, you need you need flour to create bread. And in order to create that flour, one simply needs to grind something up. So for instance, if you have Doritos, now, does that mean everything is going to rise? No, you need yeast. You need other things. There's a lot of different types of bread. At the end of the day, cooking is chemistry, right? So it's like, you know, like for instance, matzah is missing uh, yeast, which means that it doesn't rise. It's like a flat sort of cracker. Then you have different, you know, you have different types of doughs for different types of situations. You have bagel dough, you have pizza dough, you have cookie dough, right? We have all these different types of doughs. You got doughs with more butter. You got doughs with eggs and sugar. You got doughs where it's just water. You know, everything is, everything is different. But one thing is for certain, if you have a powder and you, you have water, you can make br a bread of some kind. And in this case, the, that dust is coming from human bones. So you're eating bread. Now, what does it taste like? Is it chalky? Like, how does that work? I suppose you could grind animal bones into bread and get a similar result. As a matter of fact, I should probably YouTube that and see if we could find anything about it. But the idea of, 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 of being able to do that, I mean, they make, they make bread out of like, you can make bread out of like insects. You grind up crickets and stuff. It's like really good for you. Actually, it's, you can get, um, oh, what's it called? Uh, friggin', um, you can get, uh, hmm, hold on one second. Let's see if, let's see what we could find here. Let's see what we could find here. Um, bone bread. See if it, it shows us any sort of example, just so we can know spooky breadsticks. That's not what we want. Bone bread? Question mark? No. Bone marrow? No. 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 I guess bone bakes bread or Amish white bread. I don't know, man. Point. My my point still stands. If you can grind it into a powder, you could turn it into bread, and that's what they would do, right? Maybe they talk about it, the actual process. So, and during one particular see one and during one particularly problematic siege, they even ate bread made from human bones. The road to this grisly act of baking was paved in eight in 1589, 1589, after the death of King Henry the Third. His distant cousin, Henry the Third of Navarre, was heir to the French throne. But despite having been baptized Catholic, the King of Navarre was raised as a Protestant. At the time, France was in the throes of wars of religion, a prolonged period of strife between Protestants and Catholics that lasted 36 years and took some 3 million lives. Terrible. That's what happened. You know, religious wars will do that. And what's interesting is both the, the Protestants and the Catholics, they both 
subscribe to Christ, right? Which is so ironic considering that Christ was a Jew as well. Like it, it, just to wrap your mind around the, uh, the, the semantics and nuances of religion. I believe it's, isn't it Catholic is more about like the emphasis on Mary, the mother Mary. And then uh, Protestant is more about Jesus. I don't know. Not, not a Christian. I don't know. In any case, Protestants and Catholics in general, they don't really get along. We, we've, we've seen this in other parts of history. So there, there was a 36 year wars of religion uh, and it took some 3 million lives. So it's no surprise that Henry's succession was far from straightforward. It took a four year civil war against the powerful Catholic League, an anti-Protestant group aligned with the Spanish crown for Henry to claim the throne. So, right, because the. Um, the the uh spanish inquisition right that's all they're all catholics and stuff that was right around the time that they're kicking everybody out all the jews that lived in spain were, were kicked out by they either were forced to convert or they were kicked out and want to hear something really crazy i just read this i don't know if this study is true but they say that almost 25 percent of latino and hispanic people in the world millions and millions of people Almost 25% of them have Jewish DNA, and it might stem from this very thing. So that is, I mean, it's just crazy. In any case, that's going on. That's going on in in Spain. You know, who needs who needs Game of Thrones or you know the latest you know show Vikings? We we're just talking about Vikings. Who needs any of this, that? You just crack open and well that's what what the history channel did right they were like wow the story of ragnar lothbrook is so insane that mm, wow 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 <laughs> look at this look at this look at look at this stuff look at this stuff um so in any case the um Yeah, it's nuts. The whole thing, the whole thing is nuts. They they the history channel was like, "Hey, we're going to um we're we're going to literally make a TV show, uh, a, a six season TV show out of Ragnar Lothbrok. It's it's IP, intellectual property that's in the public domain because it's the uh the Norse sagas and stuff." Um and um yeah. So anyway, anyway, as I was saying, after his victory against the League at the Battle of Ivory, Henry moved towards Paris. In the wake of his approaching armies, peasants deserted their lands and took refuge within the city. In time, they may have come to regret the decision. So again, it, there was a four-year civil war. The Catholic League was an anti-Protestant group that was backed by Spain. That's right around the time that you're doing the Catholic, Spanish, you know, Inquisition sort of thing. After his victory against the League, uh, the League at the Battle of Ivory, Henry moved towards Paris. Um, so in the wake of his approaching armies, peasants deserted their lands and took refuge within the city in the time they may have come. Right, sorry. I reread that just now. So basically, everybody ran into the city walls, the city gates, and barricaded themselves in. You have a huge, you have a lot of people in there, and there's not a lot of resources. Henry took control of several nearby towns, including Norgent, Sersane, and Province, endangering the Parisian food supply. Henry also had all windmills burned. So not only where was everybody rushing into the city? This dude was burning all the windmills. What is a windmill back then and why is it important? Today, when we think about a windmill, we're when when we're thinking about a windmill, we're thinking about how you know it's used to generate, you know, power, you know, electric power. We have like these windmills that are you turbine windmills that generate electricity and stuff. Um, but back in the day, a windmill, you were using the power of the wind to grind your grain into flour, and that's how you made bread. So windmills are this essential process for breaking down grain, an early industrialization uh, for breaking down grain and turning that grain into powder, uh, aka flour, aka the, the building block 
for baking your bread. So he's burning these windmills, making it impossible for the Parisians to produce bread, all probably to prevent the invaders from using them to, you know, wait them out. Cause it's like, Oh, we got these windmills. We can use them for our own, own, you know, um, uh, needs. Yes, I agree. DLW burning down windmills. What an infected, you know, what of a guy, this Henry, I agree. I agree. He, I mean, he essentially like that, that was a, that he was essentially assigning, you know, a death, uh, uh, a death sentence to, to so many people by May, the Parisians were starving because they can't produce the bread. They don't have the windmills. The locals ate horses and mules followed by pet dogs and cats. Imagine that. Imagine you're a, okay, here's a grim macabre situation, but again, maybe it will make you feel better about whatever personal strife you have going on in your life. Imagine a per being a Parisian boy or girl. Um, and you have a family dog or you have the family dog, you have the family cat and mom and dad take your dog or your cat from you. And they, you know, um, freaking, uh, break, break him down is the, is the way to put it, you know, essentially break down your dog or your cat into a stew. So you guys can eat for a day or two, the family pet, you got to sit there and eat. And think that you're eating Fluffy or, or Dingo or whatever the hell you named your, your dog or cat. It's nuts. So followed. So they started with the horses and the mules and they followed with pet dogs and cats. Then they moved on to grazing on grass from parks. They were eating grass just to fill their bellies. And finally, in August, Parisians resorted to M Madame de Montepensier's bread. Holy crap. I don't know what that is, but it's scaring the crap out of me. Um, so this is according to an entry. This is from August 25th, 1590. This is an entry by Parisian uh, diarist. Diarist, like a diary, like a diary writer, like a diarist. Is that what that means? Let's look that up as well. Um, a person who writes a diary. Pierre Le S. Toil. Uh, it was made of the bones of our forefathers. Oh, so you're taking your great grandfather's bones, grinding them up and making bread out of them. Uh, uh, that is nuts. And so named because Madame de Montpensier, a powerful member of the Catholic League, exalted its invention without ever de desiring to sample it. I guess that means that Madame made came up with this idea that you could bake bread from bones, but never actually sampled it. Maybe because they were rich and had other resources um, to sort of <laughs> to to deal with. Yes, you would imagine that with all the macabre band names out there, that someone forefather bones would be a uh, either a band name or a Danzig song. Grind my bones, bake my bread. How does one make bread from one's forefathers? Most accounts. Okay, so we're actually going to get the recipe. So for you guys at home, if you want to learn how to do this, you can do so by following these instructions. Okay, that's what we're going to do. How does one make bread from one's forefathers? Most accounts explain that the desperate poor first disinterred bones from the mass graves of the Holy Innocent Cemetery. So these are bones from the mass graves. Maybe that means everybody was in their own respectful crypt grave sort of situation, but they're all interred in like the walls, you know, kind of like the crypts that are under France or whatever, uh, under Paris, you have like those crazy crypts, uh, that kind of thing. So so maybe maybe that's what they're referring to. So what they did was um, uh, most accounts explain that the desperate poor first disinterred bones from the mass graves of the Holy Innocent Cemetery. Then they then ground, ground the bones into flour and baked this flour into bread. What does that smell like? What I imagine it's smelling like old dusty books. I don't know. It just must smell terrible. Uh, Henrico de Valia and people could live that like people could live. 
an Italian historian and eyewitness. So he witnessed this. He described it as vile and macabre, an abominable food so contagious that the substance having come from the dead, it's so increased by many the number. So I guess it's it, it could kill you is what he's trying to say. Let's read that again because people back in the day wrote stuff really crazy. Ready? An abominable food so contagious, meaning that it caught on so easily did this catch on. That, that's what I mean by, that's what it, contagion means, right? So contagious that the substance having come from the dead, it's so increased by many the number. That's nuts. Here's an 1857 map of Paris catacombs, which has long served as an over as overflow burial ground. So maybe that's where a lot of of the bones came from, right? That is just really, really dastardly. Um, this bone flour was not exactly an ideal replacement for wheat, right? There's probably no nutrition. There's no nutrition in the bone in the bones, right? Um, it says, it says here, a lack of gluten. What is gluten? Gluten is one of the sort of, um, it's the gummy. It's what makes bread so uh, chewy. It gives bread its chewiness. It gives it a, a malleability. Like when you pull apart, like a, uh, some, some chewy bread, I guess would be the best. Chewy is the best descriptor. Gluten is gluten is what, you know, when people are gluten free, when they have celiac gluten is what messes up their gut. So there's a lack of gluten. When you have gluten free bread, what does it do? It crumbles. That's that's what it does. You know, um, riot act Sharpie riot actually brings up a really good point here. Maybe they um, did have some regular flour or if they were smart about it. But I guess, listen, if you have some flour like the last, this is, this is done as an act of desperation. So it's not like, you know, if you are thinking ahead in, uh, you know, if you're thinking ahead and you're like, oh, we don't have enough flour to get us through, let's start cutting it with our regular flour. That's actually a really smart idea. It's a smart idea, but you're probably not going to do it. Yeah. David says bone, bone broth is good for collagen. You'd imagine they would make bone broth before they did that. Yeah, good, exactly. Uh, JD. Gluten puts the bread in bread. You're so right. Have you ever eaten a gluten-free uh, pizza dough crust? It just it crumbles when you don't have the gluten molecules. You can't. It's just not chewy and pull apart. Delicious. Um, <laughs> Amy says it. Amy says it. Great. Gluten makes you fat. It, Amy. It sure does. It sure does. Yeah. And some will tell you that it gunks up your gut. All sorts of stuff. Um, I think I think there might be some decent nutrition, but probably not many calories, some phosphorus and calcium. It's messed up thinking of kids having to eat that. It is. It is. And that's why, like, you know, at the very beginning of the stream, I was like, look, like we're talking about people that like died like 500 years ago. But like these people were like alive and like they really did have to deal with this. And it's like really sad. So we should have some level, some level of, I don't know, not res respect or whatever you want to call it. Um, somberness in understanding that this really happened to people. Uh, it it's sad. It's so friggin' sad. Yes. Okay, great, great. Thank you for that. Actually, he, um, I can't uh, buy, buy, is it by bizzo? Particularly yours, 83 says, uh, gluten is for real, like glue in your digestion. Your descriptions are correct. There you go. It's like glue. Glee. In any case, this bone flour was not exactly an ideal replacement for wheat. A lack of gluten, for example, makes it difficult for bone bread to hold together and disinterred bones are not, are no superfood. So even if they have calcium and phosphorus, it maybe it, they've it's lost some of its some of its you know the, the nutrition in that kind of way. As Gabriel Venel wrote in his uh, Precis de Mierte Medicale, I don't know. I'm sorry, I just suck at reading. The idea of reducing human bones to powder could only come from a mind essentially ignorant and overcome by hunger and by despair. <gasps> bones are not flowery, and when they are spent, 
by a long stay in human soil, they contain no nourishing element. So when they're eating, so when they're eating bones, they're not, there's no nourishing element. You're just, oh my God, did you hear that? When they're dis, they're spent by a long stay in humans, humid soil. But even during the duress of a siege, these practical difficulties were less concerning than the image of disinterring the defunct to feed the living. And you'd imagine as people are dying, like that they're also being consumed. I mean, that happened in Russia. There is what there was widespread cannibalism many times in Russia during, you know, um, uh, uh, communism during the Soviet Union, uh, the gulags. You know, there's I, I, I there's this a nightmare thing that happened. There was a nightmare island where people just were eating each other. They just had no choice. And people, you know, I mean, when your hunger Hunger drives you, you know, hunger taps into your mandula oblongata, right? Like your reptilian brain, like your survival brain, like your body is like sending all sorts of hormonal signals to your brain to override your, your frontal cortex is saying, we need to eat. We want to live, do whatever it takes to make it happen. Suddenly, especially if you have children, you have like these, not only are you looking to survive, but you want your children to live. As a father, like, knock on wood, God forbid, like, I ever should be in that situation. But, you know, you, you, you love your children. You want them to live and you'll do anything to keep them alive. And so I understand this notion of being in such a state of desperation that the only thing left to do is eat bone bread. Like, that is, it's so gnarly, but I get it. I get it, man. Um, I don't know if the catacombs were around. I guess they were because that they were talking about one of the cemeteries up ahead. It was a mass grave, but I don't think it was all the bones were not all mixed together. Like I think everybody was in their little neat cubicles and stuff. It was just that they were, I don't know. In any case, but even during the duress of a siege, these practical difficulties were less concerning than the image of disinterring the defunct uh, living. It's, uh, uh, this bread writes Madeline Fieres in her new, I can't pronounce that is bad for one simple reason. It has the taste of sacrilege and anthro, uh, anthrophangy, anthrophangy. Let's look up that word because we don't know what it means. We don't know what it means. Okay. Uh, the eating of human flesh by human beings. That's what anthrophangy is. Uh, for many, it is the abomination of desolation. Mm. It is said that widespread starvation and resulting 40,000 to 50,000 deaths were the deciding factor for King Henry to see the error of his ways. He allowed his army to provide Parisians with food. Soon after, he lifted the siege entirely and converted to Catholicism and ironically embraced the church's belief in transubstantiation. Paris, he allegedly said of his conversion, is well worth a mass. And you know what's so sad? You know what's like so, like so sad about that? Like he, he said, it is said, check this out. Let's let's read that one more time. It is said that the widespread starvation and resulting 40,000 to 50,000 deaths. So 40,000 to 50,000 people died because one guy, one freaking guy, a king, didn't want to convert to Catholicism. That's how many people had to die because of this one dude being stubborn about something. And... Like, it's just, it boggles the mind, like how people used to be pawns of leaders, like they're pawns, like you are, you are, uh, disposable in my, whatever my means are, uh, you're not, I'm not here to serve you. You're here to serve me or serve my means. Okay. Amy says something interesting here. Amy, Amy is saying that bone bread it can cause gastrointestinal distress if eaten by people. It was desperate times. I'm sure there's, you know, this was a very well-written um, 
article and the information is great, but it ends there. A fetus can turn to stone in its mother's body and go undiscovered for decades. Ah, okay. Well, that's another story for another day, I suppose. Um, <laughs> but um, I, I kind of wish the one thing, it's, this is not a criticism. It's just like, oh, it would have been nice. It would have been nice if we additionally had some scientific stuff in here talking about like what Amy is saying, like go into that in more detail. Explain to us why eating bone bread is so bad. Like we get that it's shocking and that it's sacrilegious because it's cannibalism, but like what happens to the body if you eat bone bread? That's what I really want to know. So um, if only that bread had gluten because gluten is sticky. And you know what else is sticky? Stickers. That's right. And you know what, what this channel is uh, powered by? Riot stickers. Riotstickers.com. That's where I go for my sticker needs in the past. Um, I got to tell you, uh, I loved working with Riot stickers. Uh, great do-it-yourself business. Um, and, you know, not do-it-yourself business, an independent business. But, you know, if you like to do things yourself, you got to talk to ridestickers.com. They got all your sticker needs. Banners, T-shirts, they do everything. The, I mean, you've heard the song a thousand times, ridestickers.com, ridestickers. We are the bomb. Um, they are running a deal currently only with my channel. You're not going to find this deal anywhere else. For 59 normally it's $59. But with the promo code from us, F R U M E S S, my last name, from us, and the link down in the description, you got to click into the, the description of this video. You can get 50 three inch by three inch stickers for $29.50. That's 50% off. These are vinyl stickers. Do you know how much real estate you get with nine square inches? That's three inches by three inches. Uh, if you have a band, if you have a, a film that you're promoting, whatever the case may be, you can use Riot Stickers for your means. So go to riotstickers.com. Go check them out. Um, use the promo code from us to do that. And like I said, we stay tuned. Uh, if you are a Patreon of any variety, either tier, uh, we are currently reading Return of the Living Dead, the novelization. We've read the first chapter. It's up on the Patreon, and it's up for YouTube memberships as well. Um, so go check that out. I'm going to be reading chapter two tomorrow, and that's going to be dropping. And I give a little commentary after I read the chapter talking about, you know, we talk about some of the differences and stuff. Um, also, tomorrow, we're back here again. We're talking about Hollywood accents in the 50s. That's going to be really interesting. And I a lot of stuff that I don't know. Um, then on Wednesday, we have a new episode of streaming evil live, super important because we have two contests that are running two contests. That's right. The devil lock pageant is back. So we're going to talk about that. Probably have some general theme discussion. And then Thursday, sinful celluloid is back on the channel. Chris has been struggling. His channel, um, has been suspended for some ridiculous reasons. Go, go on Twitter and lobby, lobby to them and say, Hey, bring, bring Chris's channel back. Um, in the, so, so sin, sinful celluloid is back on it, it, here, uh, for the time being, uh, temporarily until Chris gets his channel back. We're going to be talking about the movie, the last duel. I'm also recording two podcasts tomorrow for Dexter, the final season, as well as yellow jackets season one. So if you've seen yellow jackets or Dexter, go check that out. And we also last night. We did a whole show on Scream, the new Scream movie with my friend Mark J. Parker. He's just as big of a Scream fan as me. So check that out. More stuff coming. Make sure to subscribe to this channel if you haven't already. Uh, let's play the riotstickers.com video. We forgot to do that. So let's do that real quick.
Hey, okay, riotstickers.com, Riot Stickers with the bomb. I'm just gonna go to a comment or two here real quick, and we're gonna we're gonna nip this in the bud, get back to our work week tomorrow. Uh, I saw a comment up here. Steve E. Asher. We gotta do a House of Asher together on this stuff. What is House of Asher's? This this is a podcast. I can't see your full name. Um in any case, uh, reach out to me. My, uh, if if you if you use my contact, you can reach out to me, uh, and and tell me what you're talking about. Um, in in terms of that, and just so you know, guys, if this is what it is to be, you know, I was kind of like, should I? Eh, you know what? It's not even worth it. I'm not going to give it oxygen. It's not worth it. It's not worth it as much as I want to. It's not worth it. What would Glenn do in a cannibalism situation? I mean, that is like, isn't that what his, his whole attitude is about Sam? You know, life is survival. That kind of thing. Really excited to see the last duel. It's going to be good. I'm missing this channel. I'm missing his channel. I watch his celluloid films. Yeah. Um, hopefully he gets everything back, Amy. Um, I, I, it, it's, such a, it's such a bummer, man. It really is. It really is a bummer. Um, so tweet, tweet at YouTube. See, see what we can maybe, maybe if enough people tweet, uh, he's filed some appeals and stuff. He's working on it. He's working on it. Hopefully somebody, um, somebody like monkey wrenched him, I guess. I don't know. Um, I posted about it on the, on the channel. People eating other people never ends. Well, of course, that's always the, the situation. What is this? This is bone bread, baby. Bone bread. It's bread bread made out of bones. Not good. Not a not a good thing um, to deal with. Imagine being allergic to bones. That would be bad. But um, did you guys like this show? Uh, like I said, if you go back, go back to, uh, about a year ago, uh, two years ago, go back and find my Jeff reads Wikipedia. Jeff who reads Wikipedia. Jeff reads Wikipedia. That's early, early from us content like when i first started out doing something very similar to this like short sweet to the to the point i mean look we're in and out under an hour isn't that nice instead of like three and a half hours of just blah, 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 blah. it's like can't we do a show that's just you know can we do a show that's just a half hour wouldn't that be swell maybe in another year or two i'll get to a point where it's just a half hour that would be great I just want to have so much stuff to stay all the time. Um, but like crazy white boy said, he said, become a Patreon. I, I think you should become a Patreon too. Here is the Patreon. I'm going to say peace and hair grease. And we will see you tomorrow night for our chat about Hollywood accents of the 1950s and before. Hey guys, what's going on? It's Jeff. So I've decided to make a Patreon. What is Patreon? I don't know how to define a Patreon. Let me look it up. Patreon is a membership platform that makes it very easy for creators to get paid for the things that they're already creating. I want to do it full time. I want this to be my full time job. In my efforts to make that happen, I've set up this platform. Is it going to work? Is it going to be successful? I don't know. But I would rather try and crash and burn than not try at all. The goal is to create enough passive revenue so that I can continue to do this full time uninterrupted. Why? Because I love to do this. I love creating content. I love making videos. I love shooting films. I love doing podcasts. In case you couldn't tell, I love to talk and I never shut the fuck up. <laughs> So right now, I've kept the Patreon incredibly simple. There's two tiers, and that may change in the future. The Murdergram is a simple way to extend support for all of the hours and hours of free content on the channel for nothing more than a dollar. 38 cents goes to Patreon. What's a buck 38, eh? It's less than a cup of coffee, but it's a great way that you can show support for very little effort. When you divide that dollar 38 by the hours and hours and hours of time spent listening to this endless drivel of content, the dollar cost average works out. Next up is the YouTube casualty for $6 and 66 cents. <laughs> the YouTube casualty is loaded to the gills. Enjoy the archive ad-free as well as ad-free early access to special docu-style podcast videos, music reaction commentaries, and the like 
a month before they drop on YouTube, loaded with ads, I might add. You're also going to get exclusive content and behind the scenes content that is not available on YouTube or anywhere else. So you get to peek behind the veil. And believe me, there's a couple of choice pieces. Most of all, more than anything, whether you join the Patreon or not, I just want to thank each and every one of you that comes to the channel, that watches all the shows, that leaves comments, that participates, that subscribes. That's really the most important thing. This is just trying to find a way to earn a living as an artist. And with that, thank you for my TED Talk. Join the Patreon, because we need you! 66 cents.